All right, guys. I got 40 minutes to do what was an 80-minute talk, so we're going to skip over a bunch of stuff here. I am getting time? Sweet. Okay. Get, get, get me a note with the exact end time. Put it on stage. Thanks. So, wh who am I? Some guy. I do code. Who are these guys? Other awesome people. But I do want to say this. I was a theory that this was a patch that could not be reverse engineered because it was really weird. It was reverse engineered in 51 hours. So much for that theory. So we had a bunch of people who were involved. These are the guys who did it. This is why. Yeah, I just took a lot of crap over the last month, over the last couple months, whatever. I got 120 million broadband customers that are fixed. I'd do it again. I'd do it twice. Fortune 500 is even doing okay. So there are pictures of who's patched. They're pretty cool. Why all this work? So who here does not know what DNS is? You might have heard a little while. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Long story short, it is the phone book for the internet. The internet does not work on names any more than the telephone network does. You have to put a number in for any name. It is a distributed system, which means it's like voicemail hell where you keep getting bounced from one system to another. You start off on the root servers. You ask them for www.foo.com. System says, I don't know. But why don't you ask this guy over here? And then you go to the comm servers and say, hey, do you know what www.foo.com is? And they also say, I don't know. But why don't you ask this guy over here? And you do this over and over and over again until you're finally out of voicemail hell and you finally actually get what you're looking for. This is called recursion, and it is a pain in the ass. Therefore, we dedicate recursion to a set of servers called name servers, like Bind or DJB DNS or so on, where your host is just a client or a stub resolver. So what about the bad guys? If everything depends on receiving the right number for the right name, wouldn't a bad guy want his number returned instead? You try to go to Yahoo, you get a bad guy's number. You try to go to Google, you get a bad guy's number. You try to go to your bank, you get a bad guy's number. Actually, that sounds pretty damn cool. So. Here's the question. So, you know, when the name server asks, say, ns1.foo.com for www.foo.com, couldn't the bad guy reply first? Couldn't he, like, just have his answer accepted? Oh, totally. <laughs> the, uh, the way around this is called a transaction ID. It is a random number between 0 to 65,000 that allows the response from the legitimate good guy, the real ns1.foo.com, to be separated, disambiguated from the bad guy's fake reply for www.foo.com. So it's not perfect, but you know, the good guy's got an advantage. It's like 65,536 to one. Those are some pretty long odds. And even better, when the good guy wins, well, he can say how long he wins for. Is this name to number mapping gonna last a minute, an hour, a day? You know, one day times 65,000 races divided by two, that's like 84 years for the bad guy to actually win. That's a long time, right? So this was the entire concept of this draft, forgery resilience, and it basically said make your TTL as long as possible. This entire draft is a dare to the DEF CON community. Here's the problem. First, if this is to be a race between who can reply with the correct random number first, the bad guy has the starter pistol. Look, the good guy has to wait for the correct transaction ID to go over the river and through the woods to actually provide the good guy with, hey, when you reply, Use number 8312. Yeah, the bad guy doesn't need to wait. He doesn't know, but he can just be like, hey, you, go, go look up www.foo.com. Hey, did you use transaction ID one? How about two, maybe three? So the bad guy can always reply first. He may not have the right transaction ID, but he's getting there first. Second problem, and by the way, first problem was kind of known. So is the second problem. Who said the bad guy can only reply once? The winner of the race is the first person to show up with the correct number. Nowhere does it say the bad guy can't try lots and lots of random numbers. So if he can try 100 numbers, the odds go from 65,536 to 1 to 655 to 1, which are still long odds. And when he loses, he has to wait for the, the TTL. That could be like 655 days, almost two years. Or not. <laughs> Look. TTL is not a security feature. It's what I said in my talk last year. If the bad guy asks the name server to look up www.foo.com 10 times, 
there's only going to be one race with the good guy. It's going to be like the first race will happen. WWFoo.com will be looked up. The other nine times a look up is spawned. Uh, that's just coming out of the cache. That's just being remembered. Ah, but there are other names besides just WWFoo.com. Well, at least we can pretend there are. We can say, what about one.boo.com, two.boo.com, three.boo.com. The TTL, that race timing limitation, only works on an entire name, not on different subdomains. So you can just repeatedly cause lookups for one, two, three, four, five. And you may have a, only a one out of 655 chance of winning. Okay, so you try 655 names and you win. There's a problem. You are now the proud spoofer of 83.foo.com, but you wanted www.foo.com. Is there a way to get from 83 to www? Totally. <laughs> Look, here's what you do, right? You've got 83.foo.com. You wanted to steal www.foo.com. As the bad guy, you've got three possible responses. When your transaction ID is accepted, whatever you have in your message is actually going to be looked up. They're going to open up the envelope and parse what you had to say. And the three things you could say were, hey, I got the transaction ID right, and here's your answer for 83foo.com at 6666. Well, 6666. Um, and that can work. There's, I don't know the answer for 83.foo.com. Or the fun one, 83.foo.com. I don't know. But why don't you ask www.foo.com and here's its address. This has to work because it's how you got to ns1.foo.com in the first place. You went from root to com. You go from com to ns1.foo.com. You go from ns1.foo.com, as far as you know, to www.foo.com. You're basically using the other half of DNS to attack target names. So I wrote this tool called DNS Rake, named after a common method for lock picking. Sends a query to a name server for random.foo.com. The bad guy has a starter pistol. It sends 200 fake replies to the name server with transaction ID from 0 to 200. The bad guy can reply multiple times. And each of those replies contain name server redirections to www.foo.com. In technical terms, that's random www.foo.com in ns, www.foo.com, www.foo.com in a6666. It probably won't work. Oh well, try again. So these are the packets it looks like. This is the actual execution trace. Sorry, I don't have time to leave it on. This is what happens when you actually run it. Now, this works against pretty much everything in wide deployment. Bind 8, Bind 9, MSDNS, Nominum, which is used in most of the ISPs, does not necessarily work against the rest of the name servers out there, but they're just not really out there, so does that count? <laughs> um, the most commonly offered defense our DNS servers are super secure. They do not accept queries from the outside world. They must be safe. Well, can someone on the inside look up www.docspare.com? Will an IP come back? That's 157222425 <laughs> If so, you might have a problem. So look, we have this thing that you've got to realize. The attack works partially because of what are called bailiwicks. Root servers can return any name they want, and that name will be trusted. Com servers can return any name they want, and that name will be trusted as long as it ends in com. Foo.com can return any record for foo.com. Now, it wasn't always this way. This guy, Eugene Cashpaw, was like, hey, I could totally stick extra records in any reply. So when you look up eugenecashprev.com, I can create a new TLD and just say, by the way, have you heard of, I don't know, dot cash? Yeah, so uh, he got extradited from Canada and put in federal penitentiary, so don't do that. <laughs> um, but the bailiwick system was invented to deal with his issues. Um, 1997 was the last time we had a DNS bug, not a random bug. There's some awesome bugs that have happened over the last 10 years. But 1997 was the last time we had a DNS bug this bad. Um, because in 2002, with the birthday attacks that everyone thinks I was talking about, presumptuous, um, you couldn't overwrite entries that were already in the cache. So if you lost the race, you couldn't just try over and over again. 2007's Amit Klein transaction ID prediction still could not overwrite the cache. Although Amit doesn't get as much credit as he deserves. So if that was what behaved with in Bailiwick stuff, does that mean you may not make a referral either to a foreign name server or whatever 
that is out of your bailiwick. No, you totally can because that was just how DNS worked before Cash Perov broke everything. So what they did was they said, if we're told at foo.com to go look up something in bar.com, we won't reject it, but we will start from scratch. And we will go to the root and go to com and go to com and find the actual bar.com server. And we will make our way back such that foo.com can have a referral to bar.com, but we actually know the real bar.com IP. That means whenever someone looks up foo.com, the foo.com server can force an immediate lookup to bar.com. It happens instantaneously. The bad guy has the starter pistol. So what you do as the attacker is not cause random things inside behind the firewall to look up foo.com because then you have a huge timing issue. You have to know exactly when it happens. Excuse me. You don't make them look up bar.com, target.com, whatever you're trying to hit because that gives you a timing issue. What you do is you have the internal guys look up foo.com. And whenever they come to you for foo.com names, or badguy.com names, excuse me, when they come to you for badguy.com, when the internal name server comes to you for badguy.com names, you send a CNAME referral to targets in your target domain. And this works very well. Now, how do you make the internal lookups happen? Oh, let me count the ways. All right, the many starter pistols of Mr. Bad Guy. You got a web browser, don't you? <laughs> web browsers will look, do a DNS lookup every time you look at them funny. Any link, any image, any ad, anything will cause a DNS lookup. You don't even need JavaScript, though it helps. Mail servers. Anyone here work somewhere where they get email from the internet? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. That. Yeah, you know what's coming. So look, you even sniff in the general direction of a mail server on the internet and it is going to do a DNS lookup. You say hello DNS lookup, literally. Uh, you tell it who you are. It goes, I want to know more information. DNS, can you tell me? On spam check, maybe you're a spammer. Let's go ahead and look in the spammer DNS server. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, when trying to deliver a bounce? When trying to send a newsletter? Does any, if anyone here has Lyris, the uh, major email server at their site, you might want to tell them, by the way, please fix your... Who puts a custom name server in a mail server and doesn't tell anybody? Um, oh, yeah, and you know, sometimes when you mail a company, a human being replies to you, and when they do, they got to figure out where to deliver the mail. Weblog resolution is fun. Who here runs a web server? You know, who here has ever looked at their web logs? Yeah, yeah, so when it goes ahead and takes those IP addresses and turns them into names, uh, that's DNS lookups under attacker control. Uh, web bugs and documents, uh, you know, calling home is not just for privacy violation anymore. Uh, and there's lots of things in Web 2.0. IDSs are fun. You just make an IDS think you're an attacker and it wants to investigate you and thus do a DNS lookup. Uh, Roy Arend's trick was great. <laughs> So you'd get a query from a Microsoft name server and reply with another query. <laughs> Be like, it asks you a question. You go, no, 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 I got a question for you. And it would totally go look it up. Like on the port. <laughs> Send a DNS request on like port 58219. What? Um, you can spoof internal IPs from the outside network. This has no right to work, but a whole bunch of people have crappy router ACLs and think they're firewalls. Wrong. Um, so what did we do? Look. We went ahead and we said, look, we got an odds right now of one out of 65,000. We got to increase that. We got to increase that to between one out of 163 million to one out of, I say two billion, actually technically one out of four billion. This is an improvement. That's a lot of traffic to go unnoticed. It is not necessarily too much traffic, Mr. Russian physicist. We know. <laughs> yes, I will totally take an attack <laughs> that takes two billion packets over one that works in 32,000. Somehow I think it's a little easier to defend against one versus the other. Now people are saying, but I have this perfect idea, perfect solution, always oh, wrong. <laughs> Look, there are so many variants of this attack. I do not know how we got to 2008 with nobody knowing how, this, how to actually exploit this thing. You have C names, D names, extra glue. You have all the things that make the authoritative servers not reply, like this power DNS bug. You go ahead and you look up an unnamed query type as opposed to you know, A or NS or C name. There's lots of different record types in DNS. If you look up one that does not exist, 
the power DNS authoritative server just doesn't reply. So there's another way back to one out of 65,000 land and other methods. Anything that causes the cache to clear. Anytime you have naturally low TTL records. Anytime, I don't know, you can make a name server not reply because you flooded it with attacks and it decided, no, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give my firewall rules out to the outside world. Uh, anytime, how about you just pollute subdomains? That worked at the Torcon talk. There's so many variations. The whole game was this. Look, either we do point fixes, meaning we try to fix this, we try to fix this, we try to fix this, and when we screw up, we're back to 32,000 packets to misery, or we have a generic sledgehammer fix that applies a minimum level of security to vulnerabilities we don't even know about, also known as the DJB solution. DJB was totally, totally right. Even in all of his latest complaints, we actually completely agree. He's like, dude, guys, this was 99. We need real crypto. Yes, we do. <laughs> but if we had showed up back, we had this big secret summit back at Microsoft in March. If we had actually done that and said like, big DNS bug, our solution is DNSSEC. <laughs> That's right. One happy guy in Glee and the rest of you looking in horror. I'm not saying DNSSEC is not necessarily the right long-term solution, but it's sure not the right short-term solution. <laughs> so there's going to be a ton of solutions offered. You know, people are going to talk about lots and lots of things, and we've broken most of them. <laughs> but look, I will tell you this. All the things that are, you know, we'll do a little, we'll, we'll get this name server online and this name server online. Unless the root servers and the comm servers, in fact, all the TLDs, are either backwards compatible or code migrated to your solution, it doesn't matter. Because I don't care how secure ns1.foo.com is if I can pop a.gtldservers.net. Because what do you think told me to use ns1.foo.com in the first place? So I've got a blog entry at my homepage, www.docsparrow.com, that just talks about all the other things. The long and short of it is we figured out everything else was broken in at least some way. We'll figure it out that we're going to need to fight through this for like some period of time. And in the meantime, let's not have a 32,000 packets of doom. So there is some stuff from the client. I don't want to go too much in depth on it because I've got all sorts of fun server attacks. But I do want to say this. Um, there was some research a while ago about predicting the, the transaction ID in the client. Given ID 1, given ID 2, you could determine ID 3. And everyone said, that's nice. If you're ever in a position to learn ID 1, you don't need to predict ID 2. You know ID 1, you can reply first. So this bug is BS. Why did Microsoft fix it in April in the April MSRC patch? That was ridiculous. No, <laughs> it was the right thing to do. And here's why. For you to spoof a response from a DNS client to a DNS client talking to its local name server, you have to get two things right, the UDP source port and you have to get right the transaction ID. How do you know source port? Well, when you make an HTTP connection to someone before April MSRC, that connection would say go out on source port 10,000 zero. And you know what, uh, what port the next DNS request would happen on? 10,001. Oh, so that's pretty easy. But what about the actual transaction ID? You can't treat DNS in isolation because everything uses it. So when a DNS reply happens, you get two things. You get a HTTP request going out, when immediately, where, wherever the bad guy says it is. Hang on. Wait, 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 priest. When, when do I start? I'm sorry, 10 minutes from what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a t drink. <laughs> 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 
All right. So apparently I get to totally relax. <laughs> All right, so this apparently means that I get more time than I had at Black Hat, which means I get to have a whole bunch more fun. <laughs> Sweet. was I? Oh yeah. So it turns out other protocols use DNS. And when DNS is done, other protocols do things immediately to DNS controlled locations. So what that means is if you guess the right transaction ID by, I don't know, sending 65,000 packets to a DNS client, you are able to control when you guess correctly, you will get a packet time. And when you guess correctly, the HTTP query will go to the a destination that you set where. These are not huge signals. However, all we want is 16 bits for a transaction ID. 16 bits, I can leak 16 bits. Here's how we're gonna do it. Client is gonna go to a website controlled by the bad guy. Client is going to say, oh, I need to look up badguy.com against the local name server. Local name server is going to work its way throughout the internet. And it's going to find the name server of the bad guy. And the bad guy is not going to reply to the local name server. It's just going to sit there. So local name server is waiting and waiting, waiting for a reply. They can't do anything. So client is just going to sit there waiting, waiting, waiting for a reply too. And they're just going to sit there. Open port, open transaction ID, just waiting. Now the bad guy does something, but doesn't send any packets to the local name server. Bad guy sends packets directly to the client. Knows what port to use because it leaked through HTTP. Doesn't know what transaction ID to use, so he tries them all. On average, in 32,000 packets, he will guess the correct transaction ID. If he doesn't guess in time, oh well. But he eventually will guess correctly. Now, there's a couple signals here. Timing, when the HTTP connection arrives, because that's what happens when you finish a DNS reply to a web browser, you get an HTTP connection. Now, if you have a, say, a three second window and can disambiguate time by about 100 millisecond chunks, you get about five, maybe six bits of data. But you can try over and over and over again. Also, when you spoof that reply, beyond just timing information, you control the location that the web browser is going to go to. So if you have 256 addresses, you can basically say, uh, you know, at 1.3 seconds, my 130th of my IP addresses went ahead and got a packet. That actually gives you quite a few more bits. If you happen to have a class B, or if I had a class B, you know, but, um, if you happen to have a class B, you don't even need timing data. It just works. Now, if you have IPv6, you know, this is really, really easy, but mm, real world. So, um, <laughs> you know, there are totally other hosts out there. Could we return IP addresses of hosts we don't have, we don't own, and use the web browser to somehow basically borrow the other hosts for our scanning purposes? Who here remembers idle scanning? dogs right let's check it out idle scanning is all about you find 64,000 boxes on the internet that never get traffic but when they do you can tell because their IP IDs change on return packets so you go ahead and you cause some local some client to send a packet to one of 65,000 servers then you go to all 65,000 servers and say was it you was it you was it you was it? eventually it would theoretically work 
Idol scanning worked really well when it was figured out. Now there's all these bastards scanning the internet, screwing up idol scanning. Sorry. Then I was looking at pointer pollution, you know, uh, oh, when an IP address communicates somewhere, there'll be like a reverse DNS lookup. That wasn't reliable at all. Anyone here ever gone to a talk with uh, Billy Hoffman? Uh, Billy does bad things to JavaScript. And at some point, I just needed to do the Billy Hoffman option. So here was the idea. I would return one of 64,000 web browsers, one of 64,000 web servers to the client. I wouldn't know which one the client would get, but whoever it got would be under a domain I controlled, meaning I could read back from the web browser, hey, which page did you get? <laughs> that actually works fine. And you can do that either directly with content or by looking at what happens to document.cookie. So basically I'm using JavaScript to eventually pick out DNS transaction IDs. What could possibly go wrong? Of course, it's way easier with my attack. Basically, you don't even try to guess the next transaction ID. Just force repeated lookups for name, fill in whatever answer you want. And this is actually the exact attack implemented in the field, hodnsspoof.c from psychopod at yahoo.com. I don't know if ZMDA is his group name, but good job. Uh, initiate sequence to trigger a DNS lookup by the ADNS resolver, send the same range of spoofed DNS IDs in a constant flood spoofed as the primary DNS server. So it's not theoretical. Uh, Psychopa totally did it. Uh, this was about three or four days. Let's see. Was it the 25th, 26th of July? Somewhere around there. Good stuff. Uh, DNS clients have never been the focus of this work, though, because it attacks one box. Would you rather attacks one or, you know, everyone? So we've been focusing on server. <sighs> Is that it? No, well, you know, that's, that's, that's how to attack DNS. That's not the interesting question. The interesting question is why to attack DNS? Because this, this is where things get embarrassing because wow, wow, we've been doing a lot of crappy things on the internet for a long time. So check it out. Let's start with the TLDs. It is in fact possible. Yeah, you start with poisoning the TLDs. That's right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't bother with poisoning foo.com or Google or Yahoo or whatever, just poison everything. <laughs> Uh, directly you can poison it by changing the NS record off of com. Indirectly, just poison agtldservers.net, bgtldservers.net, cgtldservers.net, and so on. Now, when the bad guy poisons com, he gets all requests, even requests that he didn't know in advance that he wanted. Because remember, when you go to the root, you don't just ask, what's the next com server? Say, I'm looking for www.foo.com. So when you poison higher in the DNS hierarchy, the name server comes to you and says, hello, would you like download.microsoft.com? Would you like it for 10 days? Would you like it for 10 hours? Would you like to only take Microsoft? Would you like to take only the specific name at Microsoft? You basically get complete control. You actually get asked what you want to poison and for how long you would like it be poisoned for. Crap. <laughs> Um, the obvious first step to do from here is MX intercept. MX intercept is not just for the NSA anymore. Um, mail is special. It's special to the point that it has its own DNS record. It has an MX record. You can tell not only does someone want to speak to foo.com, they want to send an email. The attacker can actually pick off which name sir, which mails it wants to take and which ones it doesn't, can silently intercept then let the mail run off to its own destination or can interfere. Here's where we get into real world how things get popped. Okay, about a third of all attacks come from direct user action. Loading a document, downloading and installing malware. The game is to get compliance from the user to assist in executing the attack. And since users want to see dancing pigs, this is not necessarily that hard. But even your best user, even your most trained user, even the user who doesn't want to see dancing pigs still needs to get work done. And work is done by exchanging documents and exchanging executables and exchanging zip files over email. So if you're a man in the middle and you see a document going by, you don't interfere with it or you don't block it. You don't even just read it. You infect the document and root. 
when it arrives, the user's like, well, I was just having a conversation with Bob, and here's the contract that will get me a bonus this year. Open, open, open. Shouldn't the spam filter stop? When the man in the middle does intercept, it is in fact true that the actual, inter the actual manipulation is now going to come from the IP address of the bad guy and not necessarily the IP address of the real name mail server. Now, you might say, but the spam filter will catch this. How do the spam filters work? <laughs> Someone just said poorly. That guy gets a beer. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, you end up being able to hijack spam filters. You can actually go ahead and like block mail from arbitrary domains now. How great is that? So I'm not going to go fully into the voice over IP stuff, but um, SIP ain't looking too good either. SIP ends up using SRV records on a DNS, and it looks like the invite and register messages can even get say, hello, Mr. Phone over there. Please go ahead and look up this name, Starter Pistol. Zane Lackey's been looking into this. So... Beyond just mail, beyond just zip, yes, the web is uh, a little bit hosed. Um, you can directly poison all websites through the com, through com, and that will work great, but it will only let you replace content. What if you wanted to be able to read it back? What if you wanted to not just make a user think, oh, it's fake gmail.com. What if you wanted the user to go to real gmail.com? But by the way, there is some extra little script that was running in that uh, execution context. Well, you could target the static files that are loaded by any complex web app. Uh, you load a script file, you win. You load CSS, like just making an, CSS has a method called expression. And expression will run JavaScript. So all you do is poison the server, specifically targeting uh, CSS, and you win there too. If you wanted to do this to everyone and not just one particular site, we have these nice things, ad servers, analytical servers, that are run through script source. If you have script source, poison DNS name with HTTP, that one poison is going to hit the entire web. Now I know what you're thinking, SSL will save us. Uh -uh. However, I'd like to point out, did you guys know the internet is more than just the web? Like, more things use HTTP than just web browsers? <laughs> Welcome to the third age of hacking. The first age of hacking, you wanted to get, look, all security is what are you parsing and who are you parsing it for? Servers were the source of anonymous parsing for most of computer security. You wanted to pop a box, you came in over FTP, you came in over Telnet, Mail, Web, frickin' time would let you in. These were the things that consumed bytes from a bad guy. What are you parsing? Crap. Who are you parsing it for? The bad guy was the server. So these were the things that got locked down. We got a little better with servers. So now, not all. Now, everyone's focusing on client-side attacks through the web browser. Because ultimately, you can totally lure people to you. And when they are lured... They go ahead and they take attacker-controlled bytes and give it to JavaScript, ActiveX, Java, image formats, DOMs. There's so much complexity reachable through the web server. So we've been spending the last couple of years finding client-side attacks and finding them actually out in the field on porn sites, on gambling sites, etc. Now, the browser age is not over. Oh, you know, you can totally have multiple bugs going on at the same time. And indeed, these DNS issues really affect the browser. If nothing else, all these ActiveX controls that are site locked to only work on a particular domain, if that domain is HTTP colon slash slash, broken. But this is now the third age. And the third age involves everything else. This is a desktop on the internet cafe near my home. That is real. Here, you probably can't see all the icons, but here we have Flash FXP and Skype and ICQ and QuickTime and SSH Secure File Transfer and Yahoo Messenger and Logitech QuickCam, which probably has an auto updater, and Adaware SE Personal, which definitely has an auto updater, and iTunes and AIM and Golden Casino and Internet Frickin' Checkers. I think we may have some new attack surface to play with. Who here remembers the vulnerability in Sidebar last year? 
Last year, Vista came out, and uh, whenever – was it last year? Maybe it was the year before. Well, whenever Sidebar got looked at finally, someone noticed, huh, this downloads RSS feeds from the Internet. When it downloads those RSS feeds from the Internet, by the way, they can totally contain code to run. Crap. But we didn't see widespread exploitation because the code was retrieved from a fixed address that the bad guy could not change and the bad guy could not control. But with DNS, you can. This is a general theme that you can take communications that were once secure and migrate them, or if not secure, you can take communications that would once always go to a non-attacker controlled destination and you can totally take it over. So, Sidebar is not special in this regard. Browsers are really, really good client code. I may very well be the first person in computer security to have ever said that. But it's relative. Browsers have been getting their ass kicked for 10 years. AOL Instant Messenger, not so much. <laughs> There's, look, what do you guys think happens when you fuzz randomly corrupt data into weak clients? Well, my buddy, Ilya Van Sprundle, went ahead and did that. And all he did was feed random data to IRC clients. And with one tiny little fuzzer, he broke BitJex, MIRC, XChat, KVIRC, Eggdrop, Epic, Ninja, Emac, BRC, GRC, Turbo IRC. It was just a catastrophe because clients are written like crap when they don't have to deal with malicious servers. Well, most clients that have ever been written have not had to deal with malicious servers. IRC clients have apparently gotten better after this fuzzing effort, but there's a lot of other stuff that people are running. Games. Has the, uh, has the actual gaming next overlook security hole talk actually happened? Did who uh, here actually went to it? Okay, listen to that guy. Totally, totally insanely right. Uh, game developers have time to do many, many things. Right? Secure code that can deal with crappy servers is just not one of them. Or at least hadn't been because it wasn't a ship requirement. We're going to have to get a little better here. Now, now we can skip past this slide. Who needs an exploit even? Anyone hear about Evil Grade, Francisco Amato's stunt? Okay, you don't need a buffer overflow. You don't need some crazy ninja stuff. A bunch of clients will just come to you and say, hey, you got any code for me? I need a new version. You're the bad guy guy. I totally got a new version for you. <sighs> we knew this was broken. I didn't realize anyone big was still screwing this up in 2008. So Sun's got Java and OpenOffice. Apple with o Mac OS apparently. WinZip, Winamp, iTunes, LinkedIn. We knew about LinkedIn. I actually... Turns out if you send a mail to security at linkedin.com, uh, someone's listening. I sent a mail. I get a call back in 20 minutes. Oh, hi, Dan. I bet you're calling about our toolbar. Yes, among other things. <laughs> Props to LinkedIn. They fixed that pretty good. At least I think they did. Um, auto upgrade is a pain in the ass. You have to make sure the update package is signed and signed by you and signed by you with a key that says I'm supposed to be able to sign code and sign from a signature that has not been revoked and be a signature on, by the way, the same product and also be a new version because if you release something insecure six months ago, you don't want an auto upgrade back to the vulnerable version. Now you could use SSL, but people are like, oh my God, performance, I can't do it. So there's about one update system that may actually have pulled this off. Windows Update, everything else is probably hosed. Adobe might be okay at this point because they went through some headaches, but there's been some talk about Windows Update. As far as I know, there's no actual justification behind it. But yeah, those guys are pretty paranoid. There is a paper called Secure Software Updates, Disappointments and New Challenges by Bellissimo, Burgess, and Foo. It's a pretty good paper. If you're interested in the subject, I suggest you take a look. Check this out. This comes out two days after I announced there's a problem in DNS. Package managers as Achilles heels. It turns out all the Linux auto updaters are really, really broken. And uh, someone said, what keeps you up at night? The thought of attacks on your package manager or 
previously discussed and patched vulnerability in DNS. What is this or you speak of? <laughs> what, I can only use one bug at a time? DNS provides us with the man in the middle that can, we can then use to break broken package managers. There's no competition between bugs. In fact, if you take two awesome bugs and combine them, you get totally awesome bugs. <laughs> People say, but SSL, SSL will save us. All right, let's talk about SSL because this is the first big test of SSL. Has it stood up because of the strength of its crypto or has it stood up because no one could be a man in the middle on it and thus just get around whatever protections it offered? Let's find out. For SSL to be effective, first of all, you must actually use it. It works better if you plug it in and the web does not plug it in. <laughs> it, SSL is not just kind of the exception. It is barely existent on the internet right now. How many executables will you personally download insecurely this week? And remember, attackers can pick and choose what domains to snipe. So everything can be perfect right until you hit that download link from the one server that provides those downloadable executables. And then you're going to the bad guy. And you think people stopped using FTP? I didn't. FTP is still all over the place. There's foreshadowing there. I may not even go into it. Second, SSL. You must never downgrade. Too bad downgrade is a fundamental way behind most of the way we use SSL on the web. You go to www.foo.com and HTTP, and the web server says, oh, you totally should have come to me securely. Here, let me upgrade you to security. Now everything is great. You know what the bad guy does? Not that. Oh, and SSL errors. By the way, I was just thinking I could tell you, I know you wanted to have a secure link, but eh, it's not secure at all. You still want to use this site? Okay. 41% say they totally ignore the error and use the site anyway, thus obviating any of the value from security. You might say, but Dan, 43% get all worried and leave the site and won't deal with it. Yeah, that's what people say. You know what people also do? They lie a lot. <laughs> when you actually look at the data, an online bank in New Zealand had its certificate expire. It just went down. Like, time ran out. And you know what happened? 99.5% of users still entered their credentials. That one guy who didn't is probably in the room right now. <laughs> Data suggests the DNS-based attacker has a remarkably high chance of actually winning. You must actually check to see if the, the certificate is signed by someone Hey, look, guys, I have a secure connection to the bad guy. So uh, I may be scanning the Internet every once in a while, all the time, never stop. But um, I took a look at some SSL data. 327,467 SSL certificates were scanned. And I just took a look and said, I don't even want to see if the chain is valid. All I want to see is that they're even pretending to be signed by someone else, or if they're just saying, hi, I'm me, why? Because I said so. 140,355 SSL certificates because I say so. That's not security. <laughs> now you might say, but Dan, at least there's a browser error. You know, if legitimate use has a browser error, I think the user is always going to click through 100% of the time. And hey, what about the things that are not browsers? What about other applications? So I was going to talk about other applications. And then, hey, Mike, why don't you come up here? And then, then I started hearing about someone who'd actually looked into real applications, like SSL VPNs. Now, everyone, this is Mike Zussman. Say hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Somebody here. Somebody here forgot to submit to DEF CON. And I was like, yeah, I'll go speak at Black Hat, but oops, I forgot DEF CON. 
So he's here now because his work's too damn good not to be here, but he's got a drink. Cheers. All right, Mike. Why don't you tell... Fail. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Mike, a, a major other application are these SSL VPNs, right? Why, yes, Dan, they are. So, so Mike, why, why don't you take a couple seconds and tell us about how good SSL VPNs are at actually checking the certificate? I would be glad to. And the answer is, in general, they are not. Um, some of them have the ability to, but usually it's an option that can be turned on, turned off, pretty willy-nilly. What these, um, and the, the reason for that is if you're a company, you're an enterprise, and you're evaluating an SSL VPN, you're not going to go buy your own cert. You're going to use a self-signed cert, and you're going to test with it. Maybe once you actually get one in production, maybe, hopefully, you'll buy a real one and use it. But I've seen cases where that just hasn't happened, and these self-signed certs just remain in use in production. But that's not even the uh, the biggest problem with SSL VPNs. Just a little background on me. I worked for uh, a company called Whale Communications that made an SSL VPN, got bought by Microsoft, and uh, I parted ways with Microsoft, I don't know, about a year and a half ago. Something like that. Anyway, so what these SSL VPNs do, uh, these are web-based SSL VPNs. And they rely on ActiveX objects to do everything. So the first time you log into an SSL VPN, you get a nice little ActiveX installed. You've got to click through all your warnings, and you get it on there. And once it's on there, well, you don't get warned about anything anymore. That ActiveX object is used to upgrade other parts of the VPN client components and do little cool things like, I don't know, you know, in interface with WinSock and reconfigure your network stack and uh, do lots of cool things like that. But then the one feature that always bothered me about SSL VPNs and customer customers would say, hey, I, I actually worked in the support team. They'd say, hey, I'm configuring this application and when the user clicks on the link in the web portal, I really just want the application to launch automatically for the user. So, so what do we have there? We have a, a web page that's telling a client to, hey, launch this arbitrary executable. And it's all passed down from the server. So what you have is a very interesting attack vector for repurposing of these ActiveX objects. Now, you talk about site locking, saying an ActiveX can only work with a specific domain. Well, that doesn't work for SSL VPNs because everybody has their own domain name. That can't be hard-coded. You can't pass it down from the server because then an attacker can just spoof it anyway. So that, that just doesn't work. It, it can work if you, w what the Microsoft product actually did, and I, I never saw any other uh, SSL VPN do this. Uh, it, it could be out there, I just haven't seen it. Um, is the first time the ActiveX is actually invoked on the client, um, it'll prompt the user, it'll say, hey, this domain name is trying to use me. Do you want to let them do use me and uh, execute commands on your machine? The, the error message is actually, or the warning message is actually very specific that it says, uh, I can execute commands on your machine. So the user can then whitelist it for that domain only. So how do we get around that? DNS. Exactly, DNS. But fortunately, we don't even really have to worry about that with most SSL VPN vendors. So wh what I demoed at Black Hat was, um, and I'm really not out, I'm not here to slam a vendor because I actually had a very positive experience with this vendor and they were very appreciative of, uh, you know, how I handled the situation, but a different vendor. I basically knew how, our, you know, how these, uh, you know, VPN devices were made, so I figured, well, if I can just get my hands on another one, you know, I'll find all these problems. So SonicWall happened to have a demo site. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's where I went and uh, started doing a little poking around, a little research, and sure enough, uh, their base installer ActiveX likes to upgrade itself, and it likes to reach out to whatever website is invoking it and download a nice little executable and run it for you. So we fixed that. SonicWall fixed it very quickly. They have patches available, and um, you know it was a great experience. So props to SonicWall on that. Good company, takes security seriously. You know everybody's got problems, but they're doing the right thing. So, that's a little bit about SSL VPNs. But about a week ago, week and a half ago, before Black Hat, hmm? 
Okay. Never mind. <laughs> Who did you get a cert for? Login.live.com. And how did you get it? I placed an order on a big CA's website for it. He asked. <laughs> but don't worry, SSL will totally save us all. So, there are indeed a lot of things. Um, you think I'm even done with SSL? Oh, we can keep going. So, check this out. A lot of, there are actually a lot of SSL applications out there over web pages. And how do they authenticate? They usually use cookies. But okay, wait, wait, wait. We have secure cookies. That means they cannot be read over HTTP. It, however, turns out they can totally be written over HTTP. So you could have a user who is totally logged into a web app that is a totally perfect SSL web app, and there's another window in the background that's just, well, I can't read that cookie, but maybe I can change it. Do you know how many applications are actually set up to deal with someone else changing their cookie, or more accurately, changing some of their cookies? Nothing. Who here has seen this error right here, maybe as a web developer? Who here hates this error? You guys do realize that this error is here, what it's basically saying is, if you click yes, the page is not secure at all in any way, shape, or form. You think that error message makes that clear? Well, why don't we take a look at the Firefox version of that error message, which is a 10 pixel red line through a lock, which says, well, it tried to be secure, but failed. Total fail. I do like this. So, Flash has a call that says allow insecure domain. Not only does it have a call that says allow insecure domain, which does completely break SSL, but it has a freaking manifesto against the call on the Adobe site. Whoever this guy is, is my freaking hero. <laughs> I've written things like this. I never got anything like that published. That's legendary. Then there's why is this secure? The world's most depressing Google search from about two years ago. There are all these financial websites that have login forms that are hosted over HTTP. But you know, if you happen to put in credentials, they promise your credentials will be provided over SSL. And to make sure you know that it's safe, because there's no picture of a lock on the browser, they show you a picture of the lock. They all draw their own. It's a good one. It's so cute. I think this is what happened to pixel artists. They all went to make locks for bank websites. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't work at all. Look, engineers are very good at, security, at engineering to the 99% case. And the 99% case in security is no attacker. So you see a lot of security as long as there's no attacker. That's not useful, guys. So we do live in the future. We've gone from 26% being vulnerable in 2006 to maybe about 5% in 2008. The financial sites are improving, though they are not perfect. Um, there's a good paper analyzing websites for user-visible security design flaws. But there are still a lot of sites using the, oh, wait, we want to protect our users' passwords, so we'll take the credential over, pa over SSL and then switch back to HTTP for performance. This does not help. But people say, but wait, okay, Dan, these are all at other layers. At least the crypto's good of SSL. We're still using MD5. <laughs> okay, seriously, for all the comments about us knowing DNS has been broken for like 12 years, we've known MD5 has been going to fail for 12 years now. Hans Darberton did the math in 1996 and basically said, yo, this is going to break. We need to stop using it. And the United States government said, holy crap, Hans, you're totally right. And German, you, we totally do need to stop uh, using MD5. And the federal government decertified it quickly. In fact, I don't know why I say a decade later. It was like two years later. I got to go fix that. Um, there's generation. Oh, a decade ago. I see. Uh, 
Generation of Collisions on MD5 a couple years ago. We actually have full-on cloning attacks against the predecessor MD4 protocol, but we still use it and use it and use it until the moment it blows up in our face, and then we're all going to be surprised. I don't want anyone in this room to be surprised when MD5 fails miserably. Oh, yeah. Anyone remember all certificates from Debian being bad? Oh, oh, yeah. People are saying, no, 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 Kaminsky DNS bug's not very good. Debian non-random number generator, that was the bug. There's no competition, guys. We can totally use both bugs at the same time. Look, first you go ahead, you sweep the net, you find all the certificates out there that were generated by Debian. But by the way, signed by legitimate certificate authorities. Don't worry about revocation. That doesn't actually exist. So... All those public certificates can be then computed back to their private versions, and you can impersonate anyone because the CA did say this was a valid certificate. But how do you get in the middle? DNS gets you in the middle. So you combine the Debian NRNG bug with the new DNS flaw, and all of those sites that were once using a Debian-generated cert are actually un near unfixably vulnerable for five years. How nice is that? So, we've known all these things about SSL. I know what you're saying. You're saying, oh, this is all old stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Show me something new. Ha, ha. All right. Why do you think SSL certificates are valuable? Although, you might not now that Mike's told everyone. You can just ask. <laughs> but assuming you can't just ask. Anyone can buy a cert. Anyone can generate bits. What prevents any of you, besides Mike, from uh, generating a cert for www.microsoft.com? Well, look, CAs sell bits, but there is some meaning. There's an identity, and they want to sell, say, I don't know, me. They want to sell me a cert for DocSparrow.com, but not any of you. Well, what's different between us? Well, they send me an email. <laughs> so, domain validation, the way it works, the way they make sure that they give a certificate to the right person is first, they look up the domain and who is, which requires a DNS lookup. Then they send an email to the email address on file, which requires another DNS lookup. Or they visit the web page and look for a file, which requires maybe a third DNS lookup. Guess how secure SSL certificate delivery is in the face of a DNS attack? Not. Or at least it wouldn't be if I hadn't spent the entire month of July taking calls from various random certificate authorities saying, how did you know who I was and what is this I hear about a major attack? So Tom Albertson, Kelvin Ewan, Zotto Connor of Microsoft, I basically went to him and said, uh, guys, I got a big problem with SSL. Can you get me emails? 20 minutes later, I have a spreadsheet. Sweet. So VeriSign, Komodo, DigiCert, TrustWave, everyone went ahead, evaluated whether had that they had a problem, kept the whole thing secret. This stuff was actually figured out, this attack was figured out about the night before my Black Hat talk. SSLshopper.com. And they basically said, aha, the solution to this domain validation problem is you should get extended validation certificates. Basically, when you, your browser shows you a big green bar. So here's the problem. Guys, EV is just a display technology that just shows you a greater level of security. It is not a code technology, meaning if you have two windows open, one for HTTPS colon slash www.foo.com domain validated, the other for HTTPS www.foo.com extended validated, the two windows can talk to each other. The first window can actually run code inside of the other. So extended validation does nothing against a domain validation attack. Maybe someday it will, but as Colin Jackson and Adam Barth showed us, not today. You know what else is interesting? You know, CAs have web interfaces to manage previously issued certs. Web interfaces you have to sign into. <sighs> when I told everyone in July that the web was broken, I wasn't just talking about its clients. No, I was talking about servers too. Everyone, anyone confused? Who here doesn't see what's wrong? Anyone? That <laughs> rock. Yeah, check that out. Forgot my password. How does that actually work? <laughs> so 
you've got some website and you were supposed to have a password, but ah, you might forget. And so you click forgot my password and it sends you an email, but email is broken, guys. It's really bad to have email broken because when you click forgot my password and email is broken, there are three things that can happen. First, sometimes you just get the password in email, which is great because people love sharing passwords between sites. Second, you get a reset password link, which still you're going to get in, but the, the other the victim will know. Occasionally, there are additional protections where it asks for personal information. But number three is pretty rare. Number one and two are universal, and they always, always work. So, attacking Forgot My Password systems, it's just an email, meaning it forces a lookup to an attacker controlled name. You can actually create an account on a site, forget your password, get an email from the specific mail server that f provides service for Forget My Password. The mail server will talk to its name server, the name server will talk to you, you alone calm, you alone forgot my password, and every account behind that web application. It has been a long, long month of July. So, I have spent all of July on the phone with Google and Live and Yahoo and PayPal and eBay and MySpace and Facebook and LinkedIn and Bebo, Craigslist, LiveJournal, High Five, and Citrix. Freaking go to my PC. So, this is very cool that everyone fixed this issue. Be nice if we had secure email in 2008. Now, I'm not going to say I got everyone. Because there's like 170 million instances of forgot my password, forgot your password, or forgot password. But we did okay. And that's why it was so nice to have such uptake on this bug. Because holy crap, <laughs> I was not going to be able to be on the phone with everyone. So, who here knows of OpenID? Anyone still think OpenID was going to save the day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look. Here's a conversation for OpenID. Hi, I'm Fred. My friend, my friend can vouch for me. And then stick us over here, goes over to the identity provider and says, hey, dude, is that really Fred? Identity provider says, sure is. Stick us says, welcome to stick us, Fred. Yippee. Well, would that have helped? Um, how did stick us here find identity provider here? That's right, DNS. So, it gets worse. <laughs> Crap, this came out after my talk. So people were like, well, our secure open SSL, our secure open ID approach uses SSL, and SSL will save the day. Unfortunately, Ben Lorry went ahead and found that a bunch of the open ID providers were using SSL with a Debian misgenerated certificate. This is a total, I will be the first to say the DNS bug is a totally lame bug, but my God, it changed good. So right about now, you're probably thinking, all right, clients are hosed, web 2.0 is hosed, but my intro webs are safe. Are they? Are they really? Well, let us discuss the inconvenient matter of reverse DNS. We also own ARPA. Those are words I never thought I'd say. So, uh, <laughs> ARPA is the, in adder ARPA is the space that when you look up 1.2.3.4 returns abcd.com. Now, what can you do with this? Well, the obvious thing to do is spoof log entries in Apache. We've had bugs in this for a while. The Apache double reverse lookup log entry spoofing vulnerability. Apache basically gets an IP, looks up the name, and then makes sure the name goes back to that particular IP. Um, well, you know what? We control forward DNS. We control backwards DNS. We just win. So if you're building a system, do not just log the name that DNS tells you because DNS can lie. Log the name, log the IP address. There's also some interesting possibilities if you can fake a numeric TLD. I don't know that this will work, but I wonder if you can say that 6666 is in PTR, is in reverse lookup of 1.2.3.4. Then it goes, wait, wait, wait. Let me look up 1.2.3.4 you know, as an address. I'm going to say there's a .4 tap double domain. <laughs> and its address is 6666. So you might actually get like log entries that appear to have an IP address that is that's totally, totally faked. Um, you might say, but Dan, this is probably stopped by client-side APIs. Never presume an API is ever smarter than it had to be to ship. It rarely actually is. 
more reverse DNS, uh, SQL or script injection via client targeted reverse DNS. Uh, responses from reverse DNS are often thrown into a database. We knew about this. And the input is not necessarily sanitized when put into the database, but most name servers do some kind of sanity checking. But we have attacks that get around name servers. We spake the name server, and the client libraries tend to suck. So we can go ahead and say, oh, hey, uh, you want to insert something in your database? Uh, uh, you know, XP command. How you doing? To be honest, this is probably pretty unrealistic and painful to execute. Who here was at my talk last year? It all works again. So last year, what I talked about was how to use DNS. I need to get some beer here. My throat kind of aches. All right, look. Last year, my talk was all about, hey, we have the ability to get connections from a web browser that are not actually HTTP. We have plugins, Flash, and Java that are giving us TCP, and in Java's case, even UDP access to the networks that we're on. Well, this I ended up using last year to build something of a VPN solution. You come to my network, I get a VPN connection to yours. We trade, it's, it's great. Um, this was the bug last year, everyone fixed. Flash fixed this using crossdomain.xml loaded right off the IP address. Java fixed this by looking in reverse DNS, which we own. So we get all the good stuff now again. Um, we get full TCP and UDP access, but from any browser in your organization to any host behind the firewall. Bonus, your link is fully IPsec authenticated and encrypted because the web browser gets to play in full IPsec. Um, you don't get to go ahead and communicate with 127.001 in general, but you get everything else. John Heisman figured out how to get 127.001. Now, spreading the fun. Um, if you have arbitrary socket access, you know what you can do if you have UDP port 53 to any IP address? You can totally find other name servers behind the firewall and poison all of them too. Beyond that, who here knows about the SNMP v3 bug? Ah, we didn't need to authenticate that router access anyway. <laughs> 256 packets and you get into any router, that sucks. Um, so they, they fixed that, sort of. But you know what else you can do from Java at the web browser is you can spoof SNMP v3. Well, not spoof, you can just say, hey, I've got a message, uh, are you a router? Would you, would you, would you, would you like me to uh, authenticate into you and reconfigure you? <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> things that are bad because of a stupid little DNS bug. DNS to Java, Java to SNMP v3, SNMP v3 to more ownage. All right, all right, enough with the client bugs. What about servers? Are they vulnerable? Interesting question, which would you rather own, BGP or DNS? Ah, there's a four o'clock talk for the other half. So check it out, right? Look, I'm looking at BGP and I say, BGP controls the flow of packets already destined for the internet. Two boxes on the same LAN cannot be attacked with BGP because BGP is a routing protocol and two boxes on the LAN do not route. They use ARP to find one another. There's also no specificity in BGP. You can't say, I only want packets from here and this particular session at this particular moment and not from here. You pretty much have to go all or nothing, at least in terms of network regions. Um, and there's good amounts of visibility. Uh, people can see and log BGP announcements a decent amount. DNS, by contrast, controls where packets are destined on the first place. So the only reason those two boxes on the LAN used ARP and didn't route is because DNS told them they were on the same LAN and told them they didn't need to ARP. If your DNS is bad, two boxes physically next to each other are going to route to each other by way of Malaysia. Beyond that, there's some specificity in DNS. You can say for each query, you set a TTL of zero and you can choose connection by connection by connection. I want this one, not that one, this one, not that one, and here's how long I want it for. You get incredible amounts of control over just how much traffic you're gonna hijack. And you have very low visibility because seriously, nobody's looking at DNS traffic. Or at least nobody visibly. So, as I thought at Black Hat, DNS was obviously a better thing to look at than BGP, right? Uh, 
Yes, and then I met the guy uh, uh, here who's at Pelosov, who's actually doing BGP ponage here at Defcon, and he he kind of set me straight. <laughs> He's like, Dan, you know you can use BGP to hijack DNS traffic and it totally gets around your patch. Yes, yes, that actually totally works too. So um, there's a talk going on called Stealing the Internet, No Really, at 4 p.m. in track four. Um, it only works if you have BGP connectivity. But do you trust everyone with BGP connectivity? Uh, I got some score for you. Pakistan one, YouTube zero. So, there is some difficulty. You cannot poison authoritative records on servers, at least with the DNS rake attack. Now, you can poison clients. You can have the client go ahead and think that there's a record that you're then going to own. But the server side, it's you. this is a cache poisoning attack. If a server is configured to be the authoritative server for something, it's not loading it out of the cache. It knows the answer. Other caches come to it. So... A lot of there are places, there are a number of places where people are talking to only primaries or secondary authoritative servers. So there is a infrastructure called isolated split brain, where individual desktops just never, ever, ever do DNS to the outside world. These things are really, really safe. Active Directory is pretty heavy on primaries. It's pretty safe. There's no cache to corrupt there for internal names. Um, that's the big thing. I mean, everyone's thinking about DNS cache poisoning for like Google.com. Yeah, try your internal servers. It's the one time in history that the flat names that Windows use are actually a security benefit. <laughs> um, split blame environments are heavy on forwarders, which are somewhat safe because you don't know the destination of the forwarder. Um, however, if you have internal name servers that are going out to the internet, that are going off to some public store for names, there's no split brain. It's just on the internet, you can get internal addresses. It's game on because when you can go to the internet server to find out what the internal company IP address is, that's not going to be the internal company address anymore. So what can happen when internal DNS goes bad? Oh my God. <laughs> so network engineers have been awesome, right? They've been complaining that the patch is slow. They've been complaining that, how much time is it? Okay. They've complained the patch is slow. They've complained the patch is hard. The patch conflicts with NAT. The patch is a pain in the ass. But what they haven't said is, we don't need to do this. You know why? Because they totally know how long they've been ignoring the security community. <laughs> they know what kind of trouble they're in. That's why it got patched so much. So, Telnet behind the firewall? Oh, yeah. SNMP behind the firewall? Yep. Authentication servers. You think that's your radius server you're talking about? No. <laughs> Backup restore, the SOA architectures, which resolve back to names. It's DNS that actually tells you the address that is the next hop for your internal data processing. Backend databases. This was a tweet by this guy, Sean Moyer, who was actually at Black Hat. He's like joking. He's like, oh, I think Dan was talking something about DSNs. Apparently, Docking found a way to hijack everyone's ODBC connections or something. Sean was joking, but that actually works too. <laughs> I'm like, sweet. I I got another entry here. Awesome. Thanks, man. I can has your SQL queries. Come up and grab a drink. All right. Look, and even if internal DNS is hard to hit, external dependencies are totally fair game because there are God, so many connections between companies. DNS controls how servers find each other. Now, that link might be secured if SSL is used. Is anyone actually checking certificates? Because that ain't a freaking, uh, what is it not? Yeah, that's not a browser, so it's probably not checking certs. God, it's depressing that that's true. Uh, IPsec is great. People use IPsec to connect between networks, and IPsec rules are triggered for particular routes. Routes are tied to IP addresses. DNS controls what IPs are used. If DNS is corrupt, you may not go over the VPN in the first place. DNS changes destination subnet, therefore DNS can get around IPsec validation. Ah, so someone said, that's why you use X509 certificates and pre-shared keys. I'd like to point out how practiced a reply that was, because everyone gets it wrong. So, um, 
Ex ultimate external dependencies. Payment processing or offsite backup now is not a good time to have an insecure link to your offsite stores. I'm not saying anyone does, but if there's a scintilla of a chance, patch, patch, patch. Uh, SNMP into the ink against the internet. Somebody is using SNMP to log into machines on the internet. You're probably using DNS to find them. If you would like to not provide the SNMP community strings and access codes to the outside world, you might want to make sure your DNS is fixed. Also, you're parsing ASN1 from the outside world. One of the things we learned in 2002, which is one of the last big patching efforts, ASN1 parse. ASN1 is probably the mo world's most miserable protocol in the world to parse. Servers might have gotten locked down, but this is the third age. Your clients better be good too. Search engine optimization is always fun. <laughs> there's search engine optimization, and then there's owning Google's DNS. Yeah, and then who here has ever put files on a content distribution network out of curiosity? Um, like Akamai or Limelight. You ever wonder how that actually happens, where they get the data in the first place? Well, you provide the CDN and HTTP URL which uses DNS, pulls down data, and hosts it to the internet. It would be really, really, really bad if Akamai or any of the other content distribution networks had bad DNS. So, it has been a, uh, an interesting ride through what a stupid, lame, I'm, I'm the first to say, this bug should not nearly be as interesting as it actually is. The reason this bug is interesting is because everything else is hosed. So, summary. DNS servers had a core bug which allowed arbitrary cache poisoning. The bug works even when the host is behind a firewall. There are enough variants of the bug that we needed a stopgap before working on something more complete. Industry rallied pretty ridiculously to do something about this with hundreds of millions protected. DNS clients are at risk in certain circumstances, but we're really focusing on servers for now. We are entering, or perhaps holding back for a little longer, a third age of security research where all network apps are fair game, where the online games are at risk, where the instant messengers are at risk, where IRC is at risk in the real world. Auto update itself, which is all over the place, is repeatedly being done really, really badly. SSL, which is supposed to save the day, every time you look at it, it shoots itself in the face. The in fact, SSL search themselves are dependent on DNS. Um, DNS bugs ended up creating something of a skeleton key across all major websites, despite independent implementations. Internal networks are not excluded because the only thing that keeps things internal is DNS. And from the effects of Java, hey look, we get full TCP and UDP access back behind the firewall again. Your firewalls aren't doing much right now either. So. Finally, we're not even populating CDNs securely. How do you think every, everything else is going? So that's kind of what this talk's been about. And that's why I did a month of, went through a month of all of this stuff. There are some people that said it was a lot of hype. And you know what? There was a lot of noise. Because, oh my God, people needed a patch. They actually, really, truly did need to patch. All I said is there was a bug. People called BS on me. This was my reply. Lessons learned. We have got to get better at fixing infrastructure. We got really lucky with this bug. We had an amazing number of people, not just me. All I did was find a bug and tell people they needed to fix. If you look at the actual hours that I spent on this versus all the IT administrators in the world, even the companies that wrote the patch, if I have 0.001% of the hours invested, I would be shocked and appalled. Everyone came together to fix this thing this time. But the next bug is not gonna be this smooth because frankly, there's just gonna be so many more people involved because it's not going to be the kind of thing that can be kept secret for this long. We need to have disaster recovery plans that include how to handle the discovery of a flaw in any mission critical code anywhere. We need to have processes that say, your router may get owned and you have 24 hours to patch and you have to know how that's going to work. And if you need to re-architect things, you need to. Look, serviceability is survivability. And no one has ever made the link that says how serviceable a network is, is a major selling point, is a major metric for the quality of a system. It's not about what, how the network works when things are going right. It's about how the network works when things are going wrong. 
and serviceability is ultimately the measure of software flaw survivability. We also know that cooperation across cost competitors, researchers, and by the way, government can indeed be very productive. When you have 120 million users protected from just one of the providers, and it's not even the biggest, that's pretty cool. A lot of people do not realize the degree to which people have been ignoring security research and security guidance. You and I know what people should be doing, but my God, there's a lot of crap out there. If you actually look, as Mike Zussman actually looked, his talk should not be a big deal. His talk should have been known for years, but I was shocked. So we're doing a lot of things insecurely. And even with DNS fix, there are a lot of scenarios in which unencrypted IP traffic is lost to the attacker. There is no saving the internet. There is postponing the inevitable for a little longer. And every one of you, as a security person in this field, get out there, get people to fix their stuff. It's the only thing we can possibly do to help. And that's what I've got. At least that's what I've said for now.